Kayla Shellfish describes itself as the largest producer of farmed oysters and clams in the United States. So these are diploid Pacific oysters. But it all starts small, microscopically small. A kilogram of this stuff is actually more than 100 million oyster larvae, sifted, sorted, washed in seawater. So honestly, they don't look that impressive when they're in those big buckets, but through a microscope, you can tell how, well, first of all, that they're alive, that they're active, and they're ready for the next stage. But 10 years ago, these larvae were dying off and no one could figure out why. This is how they're supposed to look after three months. But up and down the coast, something in the water was killing the oysters before they could develop their shells. It's different colors are different species of plankton that we grow to feed them. As we walk by tanks of algae, food for the shellfish, Bill Dewey says it took industry, the state and federal governments, and universities to figure out what was wrong. Acidification of the ocean, the result of increased carbon dioxide being absorbed into the water. These are some baby gooey duck clams. Dewey says in Washington state, there was no debate about the problem or the cause. We need everybody's help to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and get at the CO2 pollution problem because that's what's changing the chemistry of the ocean and affecting our ability to grow our baby oysters. Acidification is one of the problems in the waters here off Washington State, and we're heading out to look at one of the buoys that they use to, to measure that. But it's also monitoring water temperature. And right now, Washington State, or at least the waters here off Washington State, are having their second marine heat wave in five years. A network of solar-powered buoys deployed by the University of Washington reaches deep into the water sending data 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 15 years. We are in the Salish Sea, which is a large inland water body that goes from Canada to the state of Washington. We're in Professor Jan Newton says in July, the buoys along the coast recorded seawater temperatures as high as four degrees Celsius above average. The data available online. When you see red, that means warmer. And what you can see is the full water column was warmer than the long-term average. So that's telling us the presence of the marine heat wave is here in Puget Sound. What's the implication of that? So the implication is a bit unknown at this point. But what is known, say scientists, is the impact of that marine heat wave a few years ago. A decline in salmon stocks, a surge in the number of dead birds, and stresses on mammals like sea lions searching further for food. In science, we talk about multiple stressors, and I think in everybody's life, they know that, right? You know, you're stressed about your budget, you're stressed about your job, you're stressed about your kids or whatever. And when you have multiple forms of stress, that's when you start to perform less. And the warming waters extend far beyond Puget Sound. So the upper 700 meters here, 700 to 2,000 meters. And Greg Johnson is an oceanographer with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Not only does he know how much more heat the oceans are absorbing, he knows how to describe it. The ocean is at warming at an average rate of about uh, 10 zettajoules a year, which is 330 terawatts. Again, a terawatt is something with 12 zeros after it. Take my word for it, it's a huge number. This is equivalent uh, to the energy of five Hiroshima bombs a second exploding continuously uh, from 1993 through the present. Think about that for a moment. Johnson says that almost unfathomable amount of heat trapped by greenhouse gases has been absorbed by the oceans for more than 25 years, extending deep below the surface. Yeah, so these are Argo profiling floats. Mm -hmm. The hard evidence of ocean warming is coming from these. There's a network of more than 3,700 in oceans around the world, sending readings every 10 days to scientists. Data that's critical to understanding the impact of global warming on our oceans. And, says Johnson, also a little disheartening. Over time, uh, since the 90s, uh, it has become clearer and clearer that measuring this warming ocean is more and more important. You know, initially I was kind of excited because my science is getting more re relevant as time goes on now, and it's kind of depressing, actually. 
it's a hard thing to study. We do need to take action. In the meantime, there are some short-term fixes. Now that shellfish farmers know acidification prevented the oyster larvae from forming shells, they monitor the pH levels in the water coming into the hatchery and keep the acid levels down. This is where the science happens in right. here. Yeah. In here is the Berkelator, named after the professor who developed it. It continuously monitors carbon dioxide in the water. But Dewey says the scientist who helped him also had a warning. Acidification will rise. Even if you can convince the world to stop burning fossil fuels today, this problem is going to get worse for you for the next 30 to 50 years because of what's already absorbed in the Pacific Ocean and in the pipeline coming your way. It's a scenario Newton knows well, but she worries the message isn't being heard. I woke up this morning and I heard on the news and it was like all about the um, stock reports and the ec economics and I'm just wishing that people were thinking, oh, the temperature anomaly in Puget Sound is two degrees Celsius and the temperature anomaly in Nanaimo is whatever it is. You know, I wish there was a higher awareness of that. And that does seem to be a source of hope among the people we talk to here, that the cold hard data may lead to a greater awareness of warming waters. And Andrew, I should point out in our brief travels around Seattle, it does seem the story of the changes in the ocean is getting a fair amount of attention in Washington state. And you mentioned how many different organizations responded to the shellfish crisis. And, and I found it surprising. You have competing companies working together, a couple of the big universities, but also government has been very involved. The state of Washington has taken the lead in identifying the impacts of climate change. And NOAA, and keep in mind that is a federal agency, it's been very involved as well. So in a country whose politics are so often divided, on this issue, at least in one state, there has been a coordinated effort.